This is Taking It to the Nub with Shirtless Mike. Boston Jimmy. Well, here we are, another week of lockdown. Yep. I have not seen Boston Jimmy except for one time, and that was very short and to the point, so I'm missing him already. <laughs> there you go. Hey, do you like Harry Potter movies? No, I'm not really into Harry uh, Potter, unfortunately. Well, we have a guy on tonight. I think he's Harry's cousin. His name is Patrick Potter. <laughs> and we're going to introduce Patrick. Yes, definitely. Patrick. What's going on, Patrick? Hey, how are you? Doing good, good. good. I was just saying in the introduction, I asked uh, Shirtless Mike if he was into Harry Potter. And he goes, no, not really. I said, well, I think I have his cousin on tonight. So, I don't know. <laughs> That's great. It's 10 bucks. <laughs> go ahead and send me the $10 royalty for that. I appreciate it. There you go. <laughs> so, Patrick, uh, to back trading companies. So, uh, there are people going to be starting to come in here and probably don't know of your brand other than um, what I've uh, reviewed out there. Um, I met you at... Uh, TPE, Tobacco Plus Expo, uh, early this year in January, and uh, you were kind enough to invite me over to a rolling event that you were doing. So let's turn the clock back a little and talk about Tobacco Trading Company and Patrick Potter and how you got into this and how does a, a guy like you get into rolling cigars? Well, lucky, I suppose. <laughs> Um, you know, I started, uh, I mean, really my, my first introduction to cigars was when I was 14 years old, working in the storeroom of my, uh, my grandfather's, uh, uh, business, which was, uh, the Tinderbox, um, here in Santa Monica. And, uh, um, you know, being the first, uh, uh, first cigar I ever smoked was a, uh, was a Onyx Black Maduro, um, I thought it was like a combination of, uh, cause I had smelled pipe tobaccos and stuff from being inside tinder boxes at the time, pipe tobacco and cigars were very competitive. Uh, a lot of people smoked pipe as much as they smoked cigars, probably maybe a little more on the pipe side. But, um, I just remember being a kid and, and smelling the Cavendish and the Oriental and the, and the, and the, um, those sort of strong tobacco smells like, wafting through the warehouse and through the retail area and um you know and so uh smoking that cigar reminds me of like eating a brownie and, and smoking a, a cavendish pipe at the same time um and uh definitely a, a positive experience um you know i i spent a lot of years doing a lot of things one of the things i did was um i uh, apprenticed to be a chef when i was 16 um, and uh, got into uh, both the hotel and the restaurant business as a result. Um, and uh, uh, spent a life doing a lot of things like uh, not being totally content, but searching for that one thing that really makes me happy, you know. Um, and as a kid, you know, you kind of don't know. You know, you just, you're going to go out in the world and try and figure it all out. And I, I was definitely the kid that didn't want to be told what to do. Um, I was going to go out there and, you know, experience, uh, life by fire, you know, and, um, and I, and so I did just no fear in the world. I didn't get taught fear growing up. I got told be fearless and, uh, you know, and so I went out and I did exactly that. Just anything that I conjured up, any kind of thing that I wanted to go out, do up, just went out and did it. Now, whether I did it well or not was another story, you know, or, you know, if I actually made money doing it, it's another story. But at the end of the day, you know, um, I set out to have a life filled with adventure. And, um, and coming full circle, you know, kind of finding myself back here. Uh, in 2015, um, I started very poorly rolling cigars. Um, I understood the fund fundamentals. Um, but I never spent any time in a factory. Um, I never spent any time, you know, um, being professionally trained. Um, it was like, uh, you know, it's like handing a kid a guitar and just saying, you know, figure it out. So I, uh, I did exactly that. 
So instead of using a ciabatta, I used a chef knife. Instead of using cigar molds, um, I used, uh, uh, <laughs> so funny. Um, I found uh, PVC piping, the ah. uh, one inch PVC piping or half inch uh, PVC piping I would cut in half and use that and then use like rubber bands to like keep, keep the, you know, I mean, I got all these other crazy stories and stuff I used to do. So, um, so I was also very ingenuitive at the same time. Um, so I would blend and I would roll and I started coming up with, you know, a bunch of different concepts, including the double Claro Habano, double footed Perfecto, um, including the unknown, um, CCR, Hoy Vivo, the one you're smoking, um, you know, conceptualized all these years ago. And not having a lot of experience in the business side of the tobacco industry and the cigar making industry, I had plenty of experience in business in general over the years. So, you know, for me, it was always about uh, aim small, miss small, um, cross utilization of ingredients, um, maximum effect, least amount of effort. Um, some of these like little cliches that, uh, that, I, I, that were handed off to me from my grandfather, from other mentors over the years that, um, that just have rung, you know, have been invaluable to me. So, um, you know, as I, uh, uh, so in 15, I started a distribution company. Um, oh, doing, so like 14, 15, you were blending cigars. 2015. 2015, okay. You I was blending, I was blending cigars. <laughs> and then were you doing this out of your house? Or you doing a tin pot? I was doing this out of my office. Out of your office, okay. Yeah. So, um, and my office is in Santa Monica. It, my office is actually the exact same office as Tinderbox International. Um, their corporate office is now my corporate office. The exact same suite and everything. It's very nostalgic. Um, so, um, so I started blending then. And I was blending for friends. Um, I was blending for myself. Um, I started getting orders of like 10, 15 sticks at a time. Um, again... They weren't perfect, um, but the idea of a gringo rolling you a cigar was pretty uh, was pretty amazing um, for a lot of people. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so a lot of my so a lot of the blends began with um, you know uh, it began with you know the things that you uh, I mean for me it came from everything came from a chef palate perspective. Um, and it's like, um, I don't want to smoke roast beef. I want to taste roast beef, those sort of, those deep, arduous, um, meaty, uh, leathery, uh, sweet, bold flavors. Um, and I want to be able to, to um, uh, I, want to, I want them to be in concert with other things. Like I wanna have a gastronomic experience when I smoke a cigar. Um, and so that was, the, that, was the, that was kind of the perspective I had um, when I started doing this. And, um, and then I got this really great option. I got this amazing opportunity um, to just go down there and do it in person. Um, and so I hopped the plane and uh, I went down to Nikkei um, and I had been all over the world at, by that point in my life. Um, I had literally been to 70 countries by then. So I, I felt very comfortable traveling, especially impromptu traveling into places that they might just not want to go. Um, you know, um, and so I, uh, I felt very comfortable going. And so I went and I found a local hotel. I got all the good ratings and I didn't know anybody to ask any, anything different. When you um, showed up in Esteli by yourself with, I mean, how, how did you get from Managua to Esteli? Did you rent a car? Um, I, uh, I didn't, actually. Did we take a cab? I took a cab. <laughs> yeah, because from what I hear, gringos are, don't drive. 
in S3. There's only a few not unless, not, makers not, not, that are gringos. Not, that, that not unless you want to pay for it. So yeah. you rented a cab. So I, got, I, I went Go outside. Off at a hotel. I went outside and I found myself a driver who, uh, you know, who spoke a little English and uh, seemed like a decent guy because I could, you know, I spot guys, you know, I'm a pretty good judge of character. And I said, uh, I need to go to Esteli. I need to go to, because I already had the hotel book before I left. I said, I just need to ride up there and I'll figure out my ride home. If there's anything I know how to do, it's get out of somewhere. <laughs> I, just have a, I, just have a, I just have a unique background, which I'm not going to talk about. So uh, let's just call it a Boy Scout background. There you go. So long story short is, is um, two hours later, uh, I'm in, uh, I'm at the hotel in Esteli and, uh, and I'm like, where do I start? And it literally is me knocking on a door and presenting a business card and saying, hi, I'm a cigar maker. I'm a, I'm, I'm a cigar distributor in California and I'm looking for a factory. And so I went, I went to the majors. I knocked on the, I went to the front gate of Perdomo handed my business card in. I waited outside for 20 minutes to be told, no, don't have an appointment. There's no one here to talk to you. Uh, I went to Natsa, did the same thing. Um, I walked over to Garcia factory, spoke to their guard for a minute, handed my business card. That wasn't happening. And, um, you know, I remember uh, um, meeting uh, meeting a guy who I vaguely remembered had a factory, um, which is, uh, you know, where I, I walk in on, uh, I ask for an introduction. I'm kind of getting, I'm a little discouraged. I, I start, you know, going through the Rolodex, looking for ways to get contact. And, and sure enough, I get myself a, uh, a contact with, uh, with uh, Guillermo Pena. Yeah, Guillermo right. Pena, he's also the one that makes uh, Rodriguez cigars in Key West. Correct. Right. Fabulous. Uh, he, he also makes Cigar Kings cigars mm. in Europe. Yep. Um, Actually. Which are very, very good. Um, very boutique. So, I, uh, you know, I just walked in and I just, you know, I just remember the look on his face like, you're bald and you have a beard. I am bald. And we have that in common. <laughs> and so he goes, what do you want to do? I said, I want to, um, I want to make cigars. I got, I got some concepts that I've already done. I've got some ideas. I want to do them. And I'm looking for a place to do them. And he said, uh, well, I will be in Miami um, in two weeks. I will make you, make you some production on, you know, based on the concepts, I'll, I'll send you, you know, I'll bring with me some stuff and uh, let's meet in Miami. So two weeks later, I'm in Miami. And he's and bringing so, to you these concepts that you know, I'm, I, I brought, I, I sat down with him for two days and designed out the concepts and the blends. Okay. Um, and he was asking me like, where did you get your, Where'd you get your knowledge from? And I said, well, you know, so when I was 16, during the apprenticeship process, we had a, one, of the, one of the things that we had to do once every quarter was a product identification test where you'd be blindfolded and served a room temperature puree of a fruit or a vegetable and have to be able to identify what it is. And you did that by flavor and by texture. And so, you know, the chef would give you some hard ones. They'd give you like apple, hickam, a potato. Mm. Yeah. And then, give you, and then give you some peas. And then give you asparagus. And then give you some spinach. And then come back to an apple. And by the time, and you weren't allowed to like swish your mouth with water. You just had to like go through it. So I was one of the very few people that got 10 out of 10. And that would advance itself all the way through stocks where, you know, what, what herbs were used in the sachet for making a stock. Um, it was very, it got very, very difficult towards the end because, you know, what are you building? You're building a chef that is supposed to be able to identify flavor 
so that you can build a recipe from scratch and invent. That's what a, that's what a chef is. Now a cook, on the other hand, follows a recipe. And that's sort of the difference between the two. Um, and so I took the same concept to tobacco. I got 41 different varietals of tobacco leaf from five different places around the world and just started learning about taste, touch, smell, color, burn, um, and um, just started building mental notes about all these things and written notes. I mean, I've got a, got a notebook that's got some really great stuff in it, you know? Um, so I said to him, I said, well, you know, so I explained that story to him and he goes, I don't know anybody that does that. That's ever done that. He goes, that's the most unique shit I've ever heard. Um, so he sat me down, you know, we sat down in the factory and he starts pulling out stuff. And I think he was testing me because he's like, all right, so I want to use all this, all this, all this viso. And I go, I go, that's not viso. I think that's Lajero. And he goes, no, 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 that's viso. I go, no, I think that's Lajero. I think, I think you're fucking with me. And he's like, <laughs> he starts, and he starts laughing. And, you know, I got some respect after, after a, a days uh, going through some stuff. So long story short is, is, is. Um, oh, hold on a second. Before we get to that, just real briefly to the audience, for those that like to learn things, how do you tell the difference between Seiko, Viso, the Harrow when you're looking at it? Well, first is the, is the question of where it was grown. So my experiences was, my experiences were with Dominican, Ecuadorian, Honduran, and Nicaraguan tobaccos, um, and um, Brazilian. So I had gotten, I had gotten Brazilian Matafina and Brazilian Aripica, um, both binder and wrapper. So I knew what that looked like. Um, and then in the, uh, in the Nicaraguan varietals, I had the Jalapa, um, and it's sort of generic because there's, you know, there's like, there's several farms down there, but at the end of the day, there's some, there's some very, to me, there's some very clear nuances. So in Jalapa, the valley is low, right? You, your, your Seco is gonna be, is gonna be light. Your Viso is gonna be a shade or two darker. And your, and your Lijero is gonna be a few shades darker than that. Um, but in Condega, which is much higher in altitude, right? Um, your Seco, could be as dark as the Jalapa Viso, mm. and the Lajero even darker than their than their than their Lajero, and the Esteli being some range in between all that. Um, two things: I, the, the the easiest way for me to notice the difference between Lajero and Viso is um, I do two tests. I, I just do a simple, really straightforward test. One is I burn I burn the leaf. If the leaf doesn't burn, it's most likely Lajero. If the, bur if the leaf burns, like immediately starts singeing, it's got enough combustion in it, probably be so. Um, and it could be a really dark seco too, but chances are it's probably a visa. Um, and so that's, that, that was the, that was the, that's my, that's what I use to figure that out. And what's your favorite tobacco that you like to work with? You know, so here's the interesting thing. I mean, <clears throat> When we talk about blending, um, I had this conversation with someone, um, a factory owner, about cigars were made with mostly beans and rice. Or, or cigars are beans and rice, mm. and mostly rice. <laughs> um, and that the, the idea that you blend a puro tobacco um, really becomes like a uh, it is. It is definitely a craft, uh, and it definitely requires, um, you know, twenty thousand hours of time in the, you know, working in a factory, able to pick up the, the sort of the subtle nuances that are between Jalapa, Esteli, Ometempe, uh, Condega, um, etc. Um, so when you're, so the, the idea is, is like you're blending a puro that's like single origin tobaccos, right? Yeah. How much blending is involved, really? You know, you're gonna follow the sort of the five basic tenets. You've got a wrapper, a binder, you've got, you know, three fillers, right? Seco, Viso, Lajero. 
some some proportional differences in that in order to create stronger flavor otherwise and of course then the ring gauge plays also a, a, a role in that so for me when i say blending for me it's when i'm utilizing tobaccos for multi-origins so i like um i like uh there's no question that i like ecuadorian habano um that 2000 seed is sickening so good um just like i like double claro from Ecuador over um, double claro from the uh, from Dominican Republic. Um, I like um, uh, San Andreas Broadleaf. So for me, it's like I utilize Mexican San Andreas, Ecuadorian something, uh, Nicaraguan something to create a blend. So that's now a blend from multi 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 origins. Um, like the unknown cigar that I make, it's got nine leaves in it. And those leaves include Ecuador, um, Brazil, San, uh, Mexican, and Nicaragua. Mm. Two Lajeros, three Visos, two Secos, a binder, and a wrapper. Reyes Valley says that's his favorite cigar that you make. So that's awesome. Thanks. Rona cigars, and he says that is the unknown. His, his favorite cigar. Who says that? Ray. Ray as well. So he's Thanks, Ray. He works. He works at uh, Corona Cigars here in Orlando. So when you d deal with the leaves, um, and all, uh, are all cigars? contain Seiko Viso Lajero, or do some just contain Viso and Lajero? What are you trying, you, you, you're writing a book, Jimmy? You're writing a book? <laughs> just educating um, consumers, bro. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I wanted to do was, um, I'm, so I, I'm, I live in LA, and I, I live in an environment where it's, it's a very, like, I belong to a couple of different lounges. And one lounge, it's very Cuban centric. Um, they're very, they're very um, resistant to trying free world cigars. They smoke, they smoke so much Cuban that it's just like their humidor is so small that it only boasts like maybe 25 facings. It's mostly, it's mostly the fact that the members smoke you, right? So. Um, over the years of being a member, I really tried to like, you know, push the envelope and, and try to get guys to try new shit. And the fact that I can roll and roll on site and like create stuff right in front of their eyes really helped to open up, open them up. Right. Um, so it's been kind of cool. But the other side, of course, is guys that smoke, just like they smoke everything that's in the humidor, whatever the case might be. So I find that the, um, the, the temperature out here is, um, is, is a little interesting. And when I go onto the East Coast, I find that, I find it opposite. It's like opposite day. Um, very, very few people in the clubs that I go to smoke Cuban and most of them smoke free will. It's really interesting to me. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted something that challenged their palates um, because a lot of the Cuban designs that are out there you know, because Cuban tobacco is limited in what you really can do in terms of the blend. And, you know, if Cuba ever were to admit or say out loud that they were going to blend their tobaccos with Dominican, Nicaraguan, Honduran, it would completely change the entire landscape of Cuban cigars, right? So they, 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 make, they make a Puro tobacco single origin product um, so that they only go so far in the blends in how much Lajero they put in or how much Seco. So my experience with being over there a few times was that they make cigars. There's a few lines that make it that are only Volado, Seco, and Viso. That's all they, that's all they put in. They don't put in Lajero. Um, and so what I did is I developed CCR, which is right there, that one right there. I developed CCR as being a Viso Seco only cigar. Um, but it's surprisingly, it'll kick, it'll kick your butt because it is definitely um, a medium cigar. 
no question. And um, properly named because it's very satisfying. Yes. Now, of course, you know, uh, Tim Swanson uh, over at Cigars Daily and I will have this argument. He already, he already uh, argued that does it really satiate his palate? And we both know that it doesn't. But mm -hmm. it certainly does for about five minutes for, for Tim. Whereas the things that I got from Guillermo when we first developed that cigar was that that's what it was doing to him. Every time he smoked the cigar, he couldn't smoke anything else for the rest of the day. <laughs> and, I was like, and, I, and he's like, I don't know if I like this very much. And I go, I go, why do you not like it? He goes, because it, it tires out my palate, he says. And I go, it tires out your palate? And he goes, yeah. And I go, that's interesting. Let's, let's get the Cuban dictionary open. Let's figure out what that's all about. And so we come up, I come up with the word satiate. Just satiates his palate. Eh, it doesn't mean he'll never smoke a cigar again. But the point is, is that it's very satisfying to smoke. And why is it satisfying to smoke? Because it's got all the beautiful characteristics that I put, that I, in my mind, in my palate, palate design, would think about, you know, any Cuban that's out there. It's, it's got floral notes. It's got leather and coffee and nut and cream and, you know, all those sort of associated uh, notes that come out of uh, any number of the, the magnums I've smoked or the, the uh, I mean, more specifically, the, the, the H. Upman or the Hoyos or some of the other things that are out there that, that offer the sort of the same similarities. Maybe the Romeo and Juliet wide church will be similar in there, um, you know, where it's all just secco volato. Um, and so the, and which is, this is viso secco. We're just use, utilizing the different verbiage depending on the country. Um, so the, the, the point of creating CCR was to give, give someone who's Cuban's palate, because that, that palate can't really support Maduro, not really, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That palate doesn't really do full body, like we know Roma craft to do full body, you know what I mean? Right, those, yeah, those right. guys, exactly. Those guys would be licking the floor, you know what I mean, to try to get that <laughs> out of their mouth. So, you know, say CR was a great option, and then creating it, um, you know, I did it in one size. We experimented in different sizes. We first tried a 52. Um, it didn't, it wasn't robust enough for me. It was really mild. Um, and I settled on the 56. But then I settled on the 56 by six when we first started. And I was finding that you were getting two, it was that extra half inch was wiping you out. So I cut it down to five and a half mm. and found that it was a perfect balance at five and a half. So say CR comes in one size only. It'll never be, it'll never be made into a Lancero. Uh, it'll never be made in anything else other than the 56 by five and a half that it's made. That's and that's the other thing. And so I'll just touch on that for a second. My whole, my whole concept as a maker is to do a 180 degree departure from the last thing that I did. And then of course not have that be similar to anything I've done. So, Everything for me is, is really thought out. I don't, I picked the Vitola because it works with the blend that I chose. Um, I don't want cigars that have seven Vitolas of the same blend because the nuance changes between the Torpedo and the Corona and this and that. Ah, it's all traditional. I get all that stuff. It's awesome that those cigars are out there. I'm, I'm uh, it, as a cigar smoker myself that doesn't smoke only his own brand. I smoke a lot of things that are in the marketplace. I want to be challenged and experiment and, and experience different things too. And so, you know, that's great that those makers are still out there and that they'll continue to make in that format. I myself am looking to do exactly what I set out to do, which is very limited runs, um, very boutique in their design. Um, not so boutique that they're strange. I don't want that. I don't want to be yeah. like, what is that are you smoking? Well, let's talk about some of them. <clears throat> let's let, let's do this. So the cigar that you and I are smoking, which is the Hoya Viva. Yeah. All right. What is this? That is the that that was a collaborative design between myself and Ernesto Carrillo. Um, I wanted something. Um, I wanted. Uh, well, first of all, I. 
the new needs friends. That's the truth. Um, you know, there's a lot of critics out there. You know, it's a four letter word. Um, and uh, there's so many different um, people out there that are trying to get, um, you know, a brand um, out there and um, they make incredibly creative. Um, and um, I mean, one of the most creative brands that I've come across has been Sinestro. Um, they make some of the most creative design things I've ever seen. Um, and that is an awesome niche that they're, they're definitely filling. Um, you know, there's um, black label trading that are doing some incredible things. Um, there's a lot of really great boutique brands out there that are, that are, that are creating, um, you know, these designs that are so amazing. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of room. I mean, we're all artists at the end of the day. That's, that's the truth behind it. There's, there's really no competition. Um, because, you know, from one day to the next, Jimmy, and you'll be the first guy to say, you know, to agree is that, you know, your mood changes like the wind, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, you could be all seven seasons in one fucking day. So yeah. <laughs> it, it means it means that anything, a anything out there is a possibility. Um, and it gives consumers the option to try so many different amazing new things that are in the marketplace that weren't here 10 years ago. Yep. You know, John Drew, fuck, thank God for him, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it's like guys went out and really stretched their creativity, really stretched out Dion Galito. I mean, holy cow. I mean, did that guy set a bar for me? I mean, I really, I'm, I've always been very impressed by Elysion. And it's like, you know, watching how all that, how that's really developed for him has been great. Um, so it's all you very did, inspiring. So you, you, you did something really unique, and I just reviewed one of the three blends. What we're talking about is the trifecta. So there are three blends in this, in this beautiful double-open-ended perfecto. And as I explained in the review, um, and you explained to me, is that you can – Light this up either side. You can smoke it from either side. The Figurado. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so what, what made you think of this cigar? Because this is unique. This is something that you don't. You it's, know. It's, it's, it is unique, but it's accessible. It's familiar. The only difference really was in creating. So. The original design of the double-footed Perfecto was, I love a Perfecto shape. I think it's the most classic design for a cigar next to the Pareo, but the skill involved in making a Perfecto 10 times more skillful than Pareo. Same with Lancero. Those that roll Lanceros only roll Lanceros, right? Um, to say that you're a Lancero roller you might, I mean, that's, that's it. You are it, you know, no. Um, so I find, I love the Perfecto shape. Um, I like the Salomon Perfect, you know, there, there's a lot of different Perfecto shapes that are out there, but I really love the, I love the, the, the equal sided Salomon or the equal sided Perfecto. And so when I was sitting there looking at this, this 60 ring gauge, um, Perfecto that was made for me on tap just because I wanted to see it. I'm just, I'm literally, I'm holding it in my hand. I'm looking at it going this way, going, what's going to stop me exactly from smoking this thing from either end? You know, scratch my head, sit down, unravel it, and start looking at, at how it was bunched. Now, we both, we, we all know that. You know, anybody's ever watched uh, rolling films, everybody's bunching from the head to the foot, right? Creates yeah. a certain concern, you know, flavor profile, burns in a certain way. Um, it, uh, without that, it, it'll burn funky. You know, you're a big guy on burn. You know what that means. And so, you know, it's like, how do you... So if I were to, if I were to cut, if I were to, to, to cut this side and light it from this side, what would I do to the cigar? Now, in some people's perspective is that nothing will change. 
it was still bunched this in particular it was just but you know so you're just smoking it in the reverse format of how it was bunched but no the wrapper was laid on in a certain pattern so was the binder and so that what you'll end up having is a potential unraveling of the cigar right some yeah. sort of defect will occur if you smoke the cigar backwards so not saying it will always happen but certainly you open the door to that possibility yeah. Well, in a perfecto, perfecto's also made the same way from a head to a foot. Because the perfecto is designed to be smoked from the cut end and not the uncut end, which you cut yourself. That's how most perfectos look, right? So I just thought, okay. well, shit, there's got to be a way to blend. That's as far as I'm going with it all. There's got to be a way to blend the cigar in a manner that allows me to roll the cigar wrapper and binder on that you can smoke the cigar from either way, either way without having a problem in the overall draw and burn of the cigar. Mm. And, and I, and once I got, once I got the concept rolling, I just went crazy. That's awesome. Uh, I, I had a question and I hope it was not addressed when my internet went out earlier in the beginning. But uh, you know you're a very, you know a small boutique brand. Are you actually are you out there in any uh, brick and mortar shops? Yeah, I'm in 40 stores so far. Nice. Nationwide. Is that just in California? Yeah. So I'm in Arizona. I'm in Utah, okay. New Mexico, uh, New York, Jersey, Connecticut, um, a bunch of places in California. Um, let's see, where else am I? Uh, Georgia, Milwaukee, and Chicago. Nice. So if somebody Brilliant. doesn't have a shop that carries your line, how can they find your cigars? Well, I do have, in California, I have both a retailer's license, I have a distributor's license, and a manufacturer's license. So in California... I can basically do all three. What I don't do is I don't try to, I try to limit where I sell to to prevent my local retailers from getting hurt because I don't like online sales. I think online sales is not good for me. So um, your, does your website have the list of all the retailers? Yes, the website does. Yeah. So if you so go if to, somebody if, lives if in New to, York, they can find. If, Oh yeah, well, and New York guys, they go to they go they go to Eagles Nest um, in Harrison, or they can go to uh, uh, Harry Sabana Hut in Harry. Minnesota. I like Harry. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's good dude. Um, yeah. So there's, um, let's see. Uh, um, so what I what I've been doing right now is I've been doing a sample pack. Um, it has basically seven of my cigars, one of each. Um, I'm selling it for seventy five dollars a pack. And what that really is designed to do is give a consumer op opportunity to try one of everything I make. And they can go to a local retailer and say, hey, listen, I really love this one cigar or all five of these cigars or whatever the case might be and help me grow my brand um, at the end of the day. Um, I don't want to really compete with my retailers. So um, I don't... Uh, I have one online relationship, which is with Tim um, Swanson at Cigars Daily. Um, so you can buy five packs from him, um, et cetera. Um, he's my only online retailer. Um, I want to stay away from the online retail stuff. Um, I, I have my own retail um, operation, which is the Continental Cigar Club. Um, and we're growing those um, over the next couple of years. So... Um, They'll be carrying, obviously they carry, you know, my full lines. Um, and I've got some other new things in the queue, which I think will be interesting. Um, I'm constantly in that creative place, but I'm also um, still only working with like the original designs that I did in like 15 and 16. I just haven't released them nationally. I did them like very short runs locally, um, kind of like test marketing. And then, of course, the FDA dropped, and I was like, well, shit. <laughs> now I'm stuck, whether I like it or not. You know what I mean? I better, you know, 
space everything out a little bit if I'm going to have some longevity. And then, of course, we still don't know how this is all going to work out with the FDA. So, you know, I'm just trying to do my best to, uh, uh, you know, stay ahead of the curve and, um, you know, continue to create without, um, you know, hurting myself. So yeah, definitely website up on the screen right now for everybody that's watching. You can go to www.tobacktradingco.com and this is where his retailers are. Okay. Search by radius. Um, he has all his offerings in here. The descriptions of them. And you get a nice little uh, about history of Patrick and what where, where his journey came from. A little video rolling. Very nice, very clean website, by the way, Patrick. It's very easy Thanks. to navigate, um, very easy to, to move around and find what you're looking for. Now, I did want to ask because uh, somebody that's watching on the uh, live right now, he was saying, you know, because when he said that you're trying to stay away from online, are you, I just wanted you to clarify, are you talking about like not going, whoring yourself out to the big guys or, you know, or just stand away? Because there's small like brick and mortars and stuff like that that sell online. And uh, so I wanted just to clarify that or whatever, because the person is a online retailer, but he's a small guy. And, uh, and, and so he, I just wanted to clarify that because, you know, for, he just it's, took it as, you it's know. Such a, it's such a, I don't know, for me, it's such a, um, listen, I, I want everyone in the world to have an opportunity to smoke what I make, you know. Um, there's, uh, but not, not, not everybody can. Not everybody yeah. will. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I think that um, I really like brick and mortars. I like tobacconists, you know. Um, uh, I like guys that hand sell cigars. I kind of focus accounts with guys that do that behavior versus, um, you know, sit behind the uh, counter and just uh, usher a guy into the humidor to pick whatever he wants. Um, I, I tend to focus more on boutique shops that take more pride in the hand sale than they do in just, uh, you know, retailing a cigar product. Um, and that might piss some people off, but I'm a tobacconist. Like that's, that's what I am too. Like, um, yeah. I mean, I went as far as becoming a master tobacconist with Tobacco University just recently. Um, so I take a lot of pride I and mean, I come from, and I, that's the other thing. Like I come from a legacy of the largest North American retailer in the country, um, probably in history. So I almost feel like it's important that I maintain a certain sort of, um, uh, brick and mortar loyalty. I don't think that I would ever, I'm, I can almost tell you that I would never do a deal with an online retailer, like any of the big 12. Um, yeah. well, I don't care what- That's more what, what I, I was not, referring to. Yeah. I, I was, this guy's I, not, he's not one of the big 12. He just was- Right, I, he's I was just like, he's, he's a little, he's a little on. guy. He's a little guy that sells online. I mean, here's the thing, like I told Tim Swanson at, at Cigars Daily, um, I'm fine with you doing online sales so long as you don't sell to Utah. Yeah. Because I have a brick and mortar in Utah that is at 86% retail, right? On top, mm -hmm. on top of the, you know, it's a very, it makes for a very expensive cigar. And if you're gonna sell to a state where I'm at and my consumer can buy the product less. All that does is hurt my retailer. Yeah. Um, and so that's my, and that's my legit problem with online anyway, but uh, I'll say it's a case by case basis. I mean, yeah, I don't want to hurt. A, I, I wouldn't want to hurt a brick and mortar, but if a brick and mortar's business is selling online, it's probably not for me. Yeah, definitely. I, I I see what you're saying. I just wanted a little bit more of a clarification, like, you know, yeah. and, and all that. That that's cool. So what else you got? I see like four, I see like fifty comments down there. What's going on? 
people are just saying hi to each other. Um, uh, Ray actually corrected me. His favorite is the unknown, and the second is the, is the says he had. Um, so yeah, so it was the unknown that is his favorite. And awesome. Let me uh, let, let me move the show a little bit. Let's just talk about some of the things that most recently came out. Um, so uh, Sunday, I put out an article. So those of you that are familiar with Jesse Flores, um, he uh, has now launched his website, uh, victims1975.com. And on this site, um, you actually, uh, you can get 10% off everything if you use Stokey Press 10 as the code. But he has all kinds of cool stuff on here. If you, um, this shirt, by the way. I really dig that shirt. But he has all those cool collections of art and um, T-shirts and hats and backpacks and, and things. So if you're, a, if you're a fan of Jesse, as I am, um, check out his site. And, you know, if you want to get some cool swag, he's the guy to go to. Um, the other uh, articles that we talked about, so we did a review. We did two reviews this week of the Tobacco Trading Company blends. We did the uh, Trifecta Double Claro Habano. Um, so this one, I actually smoked it both ways, and I talk about the difference in the notes through each one, and it was, it was quite an interesting experiment. Now, with the other two. Um, for those that are familiar with Frontier Brands, uh, Frontier Brands just recently uh, appointed John Geese as the vice president of sales and marketing. So it uh, was some of the news that came out. And J.C. Newman, uh, they just launched, uh, they launched something new called, uh, for this whole corona lockdown called uh, pound, hashtag brick house at my house. Brick my house um, is offering a variety of brick house cigars. Um, so you can check that out if you're into if you're into that uh, into that brand. Um, this is a big thing. You get this cool backpack and bag, and um, they actually were having a fifteenth. Um, Anybody that buys this is going to be put into a drawing, and one of the cool prizes is this uh, brick house lounge chair. Um, and that drawing is going to happen on the fifteenth of May. So if you, can check, you want to check that out, you can go over to jcman.com and at Brickhouse at my house. Um, and then the, uh, we, we did a review of the Amendola Family Cigars Habano 2000. That's been sitting in my humidor for a while. Um, I found that to be a pleasurable cigar. Um, I like the Amendola family and what they've done. Um, great cigars that they produce. Um, this one here uh, is what we were talking about earlier, and this is a very unique cigar. So why don't you talk a little more about this? Because what's cool about this cigar is how you've used the candela in this, not only in the binder area, but also in the fill. You sure. Give us your take on the unknown and why the unknown. Well, okay, so the unknown um, started literally from, from um, a flight. Well, the unknown was originally a design that I created in, in 15, um, but I didn't know what to call it, and I certainly didn't know how to make it on a, in a consistent level. Um, and it wasn't like fully vetted, like the blend wasn't fully done in 15. We, we made a few. I sold, I sold a bunch, um, and then, um, you know, how, what happens is, is that you don't get access to the leaf anymore, and you're screwed, right? So it was like, how do I, how do I reinvent this without reinventing it? And then how do I sort of finalize what I'm going to call it and how am I? Okay, so I'm flying home from Nikkei um, right around the time, the 13 hours from Benghazi. Um, you know, it, you know, is just hits the, uh, uh, you know, hits the flight home, right? 
And, uh, and I watched that um, in parts of it in tears, you know, um, just because it just uh, it hit me really hard. And I, um, I came home and I, uh, one of, the, one of the, the lines in the film, which I later find out was in the book, um, 13 Hours, uh, written by Mark Geist, who plays um, Oz. Who's, who's, who's actually has his nickname Oz, but you know, is in the film. Um, all the uh, all the gods, all the heavens, all the hells are within you. Something about that hits me, just like it hits him in the film, and just as it as it, as it related to the book and everything else. And so something, and I just, you know, you you you, you know, you get a song caught in your head, and you just go, you know, it just happens. This goes on and on. So I um I'm. I see. I have a dream one night, and I see this circle instead of triangle with these rays coming out at, at three different at levels. And something clicks, and it says, "You know, it's three rays heading into the trifecta of life in the in the circle of a body." Right. So all the hells, all the gods, all the heavens, all the hells are within you is the symbolization of that of that logo. So I go back to Nike, and um, and what I you know, this is talking about the sort of the brand design of it. And I'll get to the stick itself, but it plays into this whole role. So I, I, I sit down and I start mapping out what I want to do with the box and everything else. And so we take, we take the actual verbiage, all the gods, all the heavens, all the hells within you, translate it to Spanish, and I print that on the box. And then the next thing I'm like, I don't know what to call it. And it's like, well, it's like the unknown soldier you know, to some way. And so I'm going to call it the unknown cigar. And, and because social media is playing such a huge role in, in our ability to market our product, I decided to hash, just make the name of it, hashtag um, the unknown cigar. So that's actually its name, registered with the FDA as well. So um, I just, uh, so when I sat down to re sort of to map out the reblending of it all, um, one of the things that I wanted was I, I needed something that embodied the feelings I was having while watching this film. And, um, and it does that in a big way. So, um, you know, Guillermo, you have to realize, is a tradi traditionalist Cuban. Like, he worked at Partagas Factory. He worked, you know, he worked for Garcia himself, you know, Pepin. Um, like, he's Cuban. And his mythology is Cuban, right? So to do anything that's really outside the box challenges him in a big way, but it may, puts a big smile on his face at the end of the day. So I'm like, I want two fully heroes, two holy hero leaves. I want, and I'm not telling you where they're from, but I want two holy heroes. I want three visos. I want two secos. He's like, that thing is going to burn like like wildfire and i'm like i know so we, we 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 get the we get the the filler together and i'm dead set on having candela double claro ecuadorian or nicaraguan candela on the binder but it has to be double bind double bound it has to be I it's too thin otherwise and then the pennsylvania i wanted like this much from the base so that you can see that there's candela in the binder. So we smoke it. Now, mind you, the candela is not in the filler at this point. It's just a regular strong blend. This thing was so strong, Jimmy. I had to, uh, like, I turned white. I needed <laughs> saltines and fruit. Uh, I needed, like, a, I needed, I, I had to take a day off. Like, <laughs> it was so strong. And that's fresh, and I get that, right? And I know how I'm, I've learned now how to sort of equalize that, you know, that flavor profile a little bit. So I go back and I go, you know what? This needs. This needs. I'm. This is what I'm going to do. And I sat down uh, with with him, and I just said, "Bring me that candela. Let's throw that right in the middle. Let's find the viso. Just throw that right in the middle, right up next to the lajero." And uh, and he's uh, he's like, "You can't do that." <laughs> and I go, why? And he goes, because you can't do that. You're gonna, that's gonna get lost. It's gonna get lost in there. And I go, well, then we we'll need to put more. 
well, then you can't do this in a 60 ring gauge. And I go, yes, we can. No, we can't. Well, do it a 65 ring gauge. Well, I don't have a 65 mold. I got a 70. And I said, all right, let's do it a 70. Well, now we got to double up everything. Like we got to like, you know, like we got to like you know, increase our volume on everything. And I'm like, so we'll just add more Seco. We'll add more Visa. No problem. All right. You're, you're, you, 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 you're, something's wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. Oh, gringo. Yeah. Something is wrong with you. So um, we make it the way I want it. We put the candela inside and something happens 30 days later. You smoke that cigar now. And um, one of the members of the uh, club, LA Cigar Club, that's here in LA, that, um, his name is Dave, Big Dave. Big Dave. Uh, shout out to Big Dave. Big Dave smokes that cigar and says, that was the most elegant full body I've ever smoked. I said, why? Why do you say it's elegant? And he goes, it's so smooth. Nothing, it doesn't kick you in the teeth, but man, does it build. Uh, Vince Trafacci, really good friend of mine in New York. Big shout out to Vinny. Um, he, uh, he smoked that thing um, down to the label and almost passed out. He needed saltines and, and like fruit and you know water after the end. He also said it's so smooth that, it's, that the strength sneaks up on you. And so it is just this really amazing flavor profile and it makes, and the, and the, and the way that I explain it when, I, when someone asks me to, to understand the blend is that um, it incorporates all of the flavors that you want a Maduro to have. Cocoa, coffee, nut, spice, pepper, leather, earth. Um, and the only thing that I do that sort of tempers those very bold flavors is having a little bit of sweetness that comes in from the double claro. And that's what gives it balance. Now it's a balanced cigar and to such an extent that you, I mean, it's intimidating to, 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 to even think about putting in your mouth, but the fact that you, that you can smoke that cigar, it's not overwhelming. Right. And so I have a 60 ring gauge version of that by a five, which we have developed and perfected. And we have a 44 by seven Lancero that is coming out with that same blend, which is wow. so stellar. Oh, wow, I love that's, Lanceros. So that's got to be uniquely different. In, in... Well, here's the, here's the cool part. What did Guillermo grow while he was at Pepin's factory? Lanceros. He's a Lancero roller, and so is his father. Okay. So I have what is probably going to be the best Lancero in the marketplace at 44 by 7. Nice. Yeah, nice. I can't wait. I can't wait for you to try it. And, that, and then I've got milk and honey coming too, which is going to be amazing. <laughs> so we're coming up on the hour. Um, Patrick, it, 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 it's been all your show. It's been great. Um, you, I love your craft. I love your innovation that you've been doing. Um, if you have not tried any of the craft from Patrick and Tobac Trading Company, get out there and find them. Check them out. Um, I know I've listened to some people say they really like what you have, so you've been validated numerous times already tonight, which is good. Um, uh, are you planning to uh, go to the show in Vegas in July if they have it? I don't know. Okay. But I will tell you this. Um, TPE, when we met, was really successful for me. Um, I, I got to open a few more accounts. Um, and I decided that we were in a place, finally, financially, to afford to go. And so I have a booth scheduled at TPE in January 
Um, I'll be in, uh, I'll be catty corner to uh, Drew Estate uh, in a uh, 10 by 10 corner. Oh, so you um, have your own booth. I just got, I secured my booth, gave my down payment. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, and so I'm going to be there. For, I'm going to be showing for the very first time, like in a, in a trade show manner. So I'm really excited. Congratulations, sir. Thanks. That is awesome. Patrick, it's but been I'm a pleasure. Gonna do a, I'm still going to do a party afterwards because that's oh, just, you know. Party, man. <laughs> Your party was pretty awesome. I got there a little late, but it was still awesome. All right. A lot of good people at that party, I'll tell you what. Um, Big Cigar for Warriors uh, were there. Um, the plenty, of, plenty of alcohol. Patrick was, had set up a rolling table, was giving out fresh rolled cigars, which personally, I don't literally smoke fresh rolled cigars, but you smoke because you're rolling them, so it was it was good. So we had a good time, and I look forward to doing it again. Um, I will definitely be at TPE this year. I think in a much better place uh, than we've been in the last few months. And hopefully, I don't know if PCA happens or not, but we'll wait and see. Um, you know, retailers are probably having a hard time figuring out how to pay to go to Vegas in the midst of towns where they don't have a lot of re revenue coming in. Right. Well, keep an eye on that. Um, they haven't canceled, so we'll wait and see. So, Patrick, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm really grateful for the interview. I appreciate it. Thank you. Man, Thanks. it was great meeting you, and I'll definitely be checking out your cigars, and uh, I'm going to be probably getting a sampler, or, you know, go to one of your five, one of your retailers and buy from them. And uh, if Boston Jimmy has any extras, I'll probably mooch off of him to try something. <laughs> Cause I'm a cigar son, so. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Although I try not to be a mooch, but you know, I joke about it, but he, he does, you know, let me try something. And if I really like it, I always go get something, so. Awesome. Thank you, awesome. everybody. Hey, thank you. Everybody who's watching, reach out, check out the Back Trading Company and hit up Patrick on Facebook and say hi to him. Hi guys. All right. If you like this video and like to see more Stogie Press productions, please go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Thank you.